Welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. The whole purpose of this stage of our existence is to be transformed into a people more like Him. What would Jesus do? Hey, listen, that's actually a fine question, but, but a better question is, Lord, what are you doing? Because, you know, He's not done. It's not like He's, you know, disengaged. He's well aware of everything we're going through and He's wanting to use us to rightly represent Him. Only with Jesus. Only with you. Today, on our walk down the Calvary Road, we'll continue our overview of the Bible with a look at the first 21 verses of Habakkuk. We're looking at Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, the Minor Prophets, we're up to part five in that. We have just two more studies after this one and we will conclude our Old Testament segment. Then we'll start going through the New Testament. We'll look at each gospel, then Acts and Romans and First and Second Corinthians and Galatians and so on and so on till we walk through the entire uh, New Testament about a book a week at a time. Habakkuk and Zephaniah today. Habakkuk is a prophet, someone we're going to be able to relate to living in a time. Most of us will be like, hey, I know just what he's talking about. I know just how he feels. He has questions for the Lord. He wants to know how in the world can you let this go on? How can you look at us, your own people, doing everything you said not to do, not doing any of the things you told us to do, and just let it happen. Well, a powerful series of answers from the Lord will follow. And the latter chapter, there's only three chapters in each of these, but the third chapter in Habakkuk, it's a beautiful poem or song. It's actually at the end, he says, hey, put some strings to this. So we don't know if they were speaking it with strings in the background or if they were singing it. But it's thought that prior to his call to prophesy, he had been a worship leader. And I've seen a lot of that over the years. God calls people to use their natural gifts. And then he shows them within that context, the supernatural gifts and calling he has on their life. Zephaniah, well, he is like many of the earlier prophets. He, he's watched what's happened in the north. Assyria has wiped out the children of Israel. And, and he looks around and he sees his people doing the same things that led to their judgment. So that's pretty much where we're going today. Now, like some of us, Habakkuk cannot understand how God can let Judah's sin go unpunished. So he asked the Lord. And that's a really wise move, by the way. If you don't know what God's doing, it's perfectly okay to say, Lord, what in the world are you doing here? I do want to say often there's silence, but here he'll speak. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, he calls this vision and this, this heartbreak a burden, something heavy to carry and, and wearying him. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble for plundering and violence are before me? There's strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. His complaint is simple. He says, this is about as bad as it could possibly get. And I'm seeing this and I'm hearing this and I'm watching that. And again, we can relate. Things can at some point in our lifetime seem worse than they've ever been. In America, this is such a time. Well, Asaph had a similar conf confusion. It's, it's in Psalm 73. We don't have time to go there, but let me just say he looked at the prosperity of the wicked and, and he came to some conclusions that I'm not sure were accurate. He says there's no pains in their death and they're not suffering or they're not sorrowing. I think the wicked suffer in sorrow. I think they use all sorts of, uh, you know, stimulants and depressants and other things to try to deal with those issues. But he's just troubled that they're even prospering at all. He's saying the wicked are, are, you know, prospering while the godly are suffering. And then after a rather lengthy complaint against the Lord, he says, then I went into the house of the Lord and, and I saw their end. And he begins to describe how quickly, in a moment, they go from, man, I'm at the top of the world, to slipping and sliding into absolute destruction. And then he says, I was like a brute beast 
before you. I, I realize, Lord, how foolish I am, how ignorant I am of what you're actually doing. Well, we're going to get to see in this book, Habakkuk, go from complaining to just well, worshiping the Lord. And we'll get to, to see that toward the end. Well, God's answer to Habakkuk suggests that, that he was not just letting it happen or, or, or ignorant or apathetic, ignorant about it or apathetic toward it. No, he says, listen, if I told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't believe it. And then he goes ahead and he tells him. So there it is in verse five. He says, look among the nations, watch and be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe though I told, though it were told to you. Then he goes ahead, verse six, indeed, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They're terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses, he describes, swifter than leopards uh, and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. The rest of this description of them and their transgressions use words like violence and scoffing and scorning and transgressing and committing offense. And in the midst of all that, we get Habakkuk's response where he basically says, what? No way. I don't believe it. And God doesn't even say, I tried to tell you, but that's what happens next. Are you not, verse 12, from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die? O oh Lord, you've appointed them for judgment. O oh rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours one more righteous than he? And I think this might've been his mistake. He thought, well, we're better than them. So why is he judging? Well, no, he knew they needed to be judged, right? That's his first complaint. Why aren't you judging us? And then when he says, okay, here, here it comes, he's like, not them. I find we do that. We're like, Lord, do something. And then he says, okay, I'll do something. Well, not that. Couldn't you do it like this? Wouldn't you be willing to, we're like, hey, we're trying to negotiate and judgment's about to fall. And so in the midst of all of this, he, he's, God's just saying to him, look, I've got a plan. You're not gonna like it or understand it, but it is in fact my plan. He's bringing the Babylonians to discipline you. Now, when the Assyrians were conquered by the Babylonians, you can bet those in Judah were cheering them on. Now the Babylonians are looking at them and they're like, wait, wait, no, that's not right. And so God uses the Assyrians to judge his, well, to discipline his disobedient, rebellious people in the north. And he uses the Babylonians to take out the Assyrians so they will be his tool, his hammer to take on and take out Judah. But again, it's discipline, not destruction. Could have destroyed him. He decided that's not what he was going to do. He'd made promises to Abe, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to others. And he always preserves a remnant of his people. Well, chapter two is one of my favorite, not just in uh, Habakkuk, but in the minor prophets, because he lays out a couple things. He gives us some principles we can apply. And then he lays out something that is oh so important. And we'll take a look at it. Jump down to chapter two, verse one. I will stand my watch. I'll set myself on the rampart. Watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. I like that. He goes, okay, I'm going to wait for the Lord to speak. I'm sure he's going to rebuke me, but I still want to hear what he has to say. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. He says, I want you to write down, print what I'm giving you. I want you to preserve it that those who read it will be able to run with it, that they will proclaim it. And this has always been the plan. Write it down, keep it preserved and perfect, and then proclaim it. And that's what needs to happen today. We have the word. We know it's his will and we know what's coming in a generation that doesn't. And he's saying, proclaim it, run with it. And I like that picture. For the vision, verse three, is yet for an appointed time, but... At the end, it will speak and not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. 
but the just shall live by his faith. This word faith only appears twice in the entire Old Testament. The first time it's a negative because he speaks in Deuteronomy 32, 20 of those with no faith. So not that the word faith is negative, but it's used in a negative way. They lack any of it. This is the only other place in the Old Testament where the word faith appears. Why does that matter to us? Because it's used 245 times in the New Testament. In fact, Three different passages grab hold of this one statement. The just shall live by his faith. They drop the his, but it's quoted three times in three different contexts to really lay out three different aspects of our relationship to God. First of all, in the book of Romans, which was written to establish the universal need for and the grounds of man's justification before God. And this is important because, well, we, by nature, are sinners, and by act, we prove it. By actions, we demonstrate it. And the question is, how can man be just in the sight of God? How can men, sinful men, be justified in the sight of God? Well, let me pose a question or two. If you were falsely accused and you went to court, you're accused of a crime, and I use the word falsely with real hope, I mean, not that I want you to be falsely accused. It's just if you ever are accused, let it be a false accusation, right? If you're falsely accused, you would hope the judge would see the truth and justify you, declare that you're not guilty. And that's what it means to be justified. It's a little more than not guilty because when you're justified, you're treated as if none of that ever happened. You know, if you go to court and they find you not guilty, they might think we should still keep an eye on them. It's like if you've ever been pulled over, and I know probably one or two of you at least, for going a little beyond the speed limit, and they let you go. And you're like, oh, thank you, Lord. I really, I could not deal with that ticket right now and all that. Then you're driving down, and you notice he's following you still, though. And what are you thinking? Oh, my gosh, he's trying to catch me doing something else wrong. And you're all paranoid. And once you're justified, that doesn't happen. Once God says, just as if I never sinned, we have that play on words. So... Here's the problem. We're not just talking about crime. We're talking about sin. And we're all guilty sinners. So there's no hope of just standing before God and saying, not guilty. Well, some might, but I don't encourage it. So since we're guilty sinners, we're in need of mercy. And here's the catch. God has to be just even in his showing of mercy. Later, we'll read in wrath, show mercy in wrath. Remember mercy. But God has to be just, holy, and merciful. And so in order to do that, well, we have to know, how can he be merciful to me and still be just in doing so? Well, if we confess our sins, we read, he's faithful. That means we can trust and count on him to do it. And just, that means it's right for him to do, to forgive us and cleanse us of all our transgressions, all our sins. But the question remains, how does that happen? I mean, I get it. I confess my sin. He's faithful. He's just. He forgives me and cleanses me. But on what basis? And and the answer is in this statement, the just shall live by his faith. Well, in Romans chapter 1, and that's where we first have it, Romans 1, 16 and 17, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the answer. This is how he can be merciful and just to guilty sinners like us. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, that that his death is sufficient to cleanse and cover our every sin, for in it, the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those who walk by faith, who who walk in faith, must first be justified. And that happens when we put this little measure of faith he says he's given to every one of us in him, in his promises. We're not working for it. We're, We're not claiming we deserve it. We're just recipients of it. So the just shall live by faith. 
Say you're a renter. Actually, some of you rent. I won't ask how many of you. If you're a renter, you have a landlord or property manager, but but that landlord most likely has a mortgage. And so you're having a bad month. Some of you are going to say, how did you know? This is exactly what's happened to me. Your, your car breaks down, you get the flu, you got to fix the car, and then you, you, know, you, can, you miss a bunch of work days and your job only pays you when you show up and work. So you have to go to your landlord, and I see a lot of smiles, some from older guys like me, which just means that's happened you know, at some point. But anyway, here's the point. You go to your landlord and you're like, look, I can't pay all my rent. And here's what happened. I, my car broke. I got sick. I missed work. But I promise to make it up to you. Please let me give you this portion and I'll work and I'll give you the rest as soon as I can. But the landlord looks at you and he says, you know what? I like you. I like you as, as, as a, a renter and, and you're good people. And he goes, I'm just going to forgive you that part of your debt. You owe it, but he's forgiven you it. Now, the landlord, as I mentioned, he, he has a mortgage and that mortgage is usually with a bank and the bank will not be as forgiving as the landlord is. He can't go to the bank and say, hey, my renter had a really bad week and he didn't give me all the money, so I'm not going to give you all your money. It just doesn't work like that because here, here's what the Lord showed me anyway, that the, the bank, it's like the law. The the law has no mercy. It it can't forgive. It wasn't created to do that. It was created to say guilty. And everybody is. And so the the bank is is like the law. And the landlord, that's our Lord, you see. That's that's the the grace of God. That's the forgiveness of God. That's that's what he's done. So, So it cost you, by the way, how much to humble yourself and, and go and say, I just can't pay it. Forgive me for now and I'll make it good to you. It costs you just a bit of humility. What does it cost your landlord? It costs everything you didn't pay. He still has to pay. And that in a simple nutshell is why Jesus had to die on the cross. If you're new to all of this or you're trying to process, why did God let him suffer like that his only begotten son why would he because that's what we had coming and we've shared the principle in the past the one who forgives has to pay and there's always a cost well Galatians uses this phrase next Galatians was written to a church infiltrated by men who were teaching the core principle of a relationship with God wasn't love but law and so It's a serious problem, and we'll see it when we get to the book of Galatians, a church that began in the spirit but was trying to perfect themselves in the flesh and under the law. They sought what was impossible. You can't be justified except by God's mercy and grace, nor can you be sanctified or or carried along. You know, you can't mature in the flesh begins in the spirit and it has to continue in the spirit. So, so listen, it's Galatians 3.10. He says, as many are as of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. What's that saying? He's saying, unless you can keep the law perfectly, the law can't save you. And the law really, I mean, Jesus actually did keep the law perfectly. Important to note that. He did always those things that please the Father, tempted and always yet without sin. So he did what's impossible for us. That was also necessary, by the way, as we'll see later in the study. He had to be a perfect, sinless sacrifice, and he was all of that and more. But listen, as he goes on in verse 11, and this is Galatians 3.11, you can look at it later, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Romans emphasized the the means of justification. The just shall live by faith. Here in Galatians, it's that the results of that, that justification, the just shall live by faith. It begins and continues and concludes in faith. Our part is to believe him. He offers pardon, we receive it. He offers forgiveness, we receive it. He offers mercy. Hey, who doesn't want that? No one in his right mind would stand before God and say, I demand justice. 
Because if you want to know what justice is, you look at the cross. That's just. That's right. That's what we had coming. And worse, because that's a temporal thing. What's on the other side of it for the unbeliever of death? Oh my gosh, inconceivable. Well, Hebrews is the third and final New Testament passage that quotes this particular passage. Hebrews was written to magnify Jesus and remind those who trusted in him to stay focused on him, to keep the main thing, the main thing, the main one, the main one. And I've noticed To the extent we drift away from Jesus as individuals, as families, as a fellowship, as a religious or spiritual community, that the the further we get from him, the stranger things get for us. Because the whole purpose of this stage of our existence is to be transformed into a people more like him. So if I'm not asking, remember those little bracelets, maybe they're still around, what would Jesus do? Hey, listen, that's actually a fine question, but, but a better question is, Lord, what are you doing? Because, you know, he's not done. It's not like he's, you know, disengaged. He's well aware of everything we're going through, and he's wanting to use us to rightly represent him. So it's, Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, anyway, Hebrews says it like this. It's Hebrews 10, 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And in verse 38 of Hebrews 10, he says, Now the just shall live by faith. And the emphasis in that particular book, Hebrews, is on those last two words. Those who've been justified and are walking and living in that justification must do it and continue to do it by faith. If anyone draws back, he says, my soul has no pleasure in him. Hebrews 11 one says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and it is the assurance of things um, unseen. And so important for us, substance of things hoped for, the evidence or assurance of things not seen. A hero's record follows. If you read through Hebrews 11, again, wonderful reading because it it shows us all these people called by God and used by God. And we see in every instance, their faith was active. Their faith was demonstrated. Their faith produced. And, And James grabs a hold of all of this at one point and says, listen, show me your faith. And I think a bit, I don't know if sarcastic is the right word, but he says, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. What's he saying? If you can show me your faith without works, go ahead and do it. But it's impossible to demonstrate faith to another except for God who can see our heart, who knows we have faith in him. We cannot demonstrate that except through our works. Now, he's not saying that, that works is the, the, the way to faith. He's saying works are the result of faith. And so it's, it, we don't ever want to get the cart before the horse, as they used to say when they had carts and horses around. Um, did you know there used to be, not to change the subject, but just because it came to mind, when we met on the vet, in the Veterans Hall, oh, 30 plus years ago, There was a train that went down the Esplanade at the time of our evening service. A real train, not a trolley car, a train right down the Esplanade. And we'd be in there and it would be, we'd be worshiping like we were really quiet in the music guide and we're all just, and I'm like, all this stuff going on out there. Just crazy. Well, anyway, back in the horse and buggy days, they used to say, you don't want to get the cart before the horse. Why? It's real hard for the horse to push the cart. And, and, and here the point is, if we try to work for that which can only be gifted to us, well, we'll never receive the gift. We'll never do enough. And we'll never have done enough. So without faith, it is impossible, Hebrews eleven six 6, to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he means must believe that he is the true and the living God, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Yes, the just shall live by faith. We're glad you could join us today on The Calvary Road. Listen in next week as we finish our study of Habakkuk and look into Zephaniah as well. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico. You can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to connect with us and 
find more from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to the Calvary Road podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We hope to hear from you soon. And until next time, may God bless your walk down the Calvary Road. And your grace.